Let's kick things off. Welcome to the Social Procurement, 20, Social Procurement Champion Awards for 2021. These awards recognize those players in the social procurement ecosystem who are making strides to harness the power of purchasing to shape healthy, diverse, and inclusive communities. This year, we'll be recognizing a purchaser in the form of a municipality in the city of Calgary. We'll be recognizing a community advocacy group, the Brenton Flats Community Benefits Coalition, and we'll be recognizing within the social enterprise sector four construction-based social enterprises who are doing amazing work um, in selling with impact and creating impact in their communities. I'd like to recognize last year's champions, which were SAP, Shandos Construction, um, the City of Vancouver Community Benefits Agreement, and the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative. All of these organizations are continuing their fantastic work, and we hear from many of them today in social procurement. All of our winners today will get a custom mug made by a Vancouver social enterprise called Just Potters that recognize them as a social procurement champion award winner. Um, and we'll be sending those out to you all. I would love to show them to you, but unfortunately I was not able to get it on time. So for the first award, I'd like to introduce the presenter. Ryan Turnbull is a member of parliament for Whitby, a champion for social enterprise, chair of the social innovation caucus, and he has been advocating for social procurement and policy. Welcome, Ryan. Well, thank you, Tori. It's great to be here. It's an honor uh, to be presenting this award today uh, to a great uh, champion that I think it's, uh, it's a privilege for us all to know and, and honor. So from the very first Canadian Community Benefit Agreement for the 2010 Olympic Village in Vancouver to successful social procurement advances in cities like Calgary, Edmonton, and Toronto, it's important for us to recognize the essential role of community-based leadership and advocacy in the progress we are making in social procurement across Canada. I'm very proud and honored to announce that our social procurement champions for community advocacy this year are the, the Le Breton Flats Community Benefits Coalition in Ottawa. Notice I'm using plural because the Le Breton Flats Community Benefits Coalition is a collaboration of 31 community organizations advocating for a CBA approach to the redevelopment of a 29 hectare or 72 acre federally owned tract of land in Ottawa, and thereby stretch the value of every dollar of investment to realize multiple benefits and outcomes for communities. This advocacy has led to collaboration with the city of Ottawa and includes efforts to realize social procurement policies and initiatives, thereby supporting the burgeoning cluster of social enterprises in the Ottawa region. This year, we celebrate the forward thinking efforts of the Le Breton Flats Community Benefit Coalition, which was initiated and driven by volunteers from the communities that will be directly impacted by the land transfer. Congratulations to Martin Adelaire, and all of the community organizations that are part of the Le Breton Flats Community Benefit Coalition. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you to Buy Social, David LePage, and Tori, and the amazing team. This is a great honor that I accept on behalf of our 31 members and allies, and there are thousands of constituents in Ottawa. And uh, we uh, accept this on behalf of uh, a wide diversity of Ottawa citizens that are working at the grassroots level. We have representation from Indigenous organizations, health, affordable housing, sustainability, and many other, including community associations. Um, so thank you very much. Welcome, Martin. We're so thrilled. Thank you for accepting that award. I'd like to ask you a question now. Why do you think it is important to have community leadership in policy design? Well, I think first and foremost, um, grassroots uh, community involvement is uh, the most democratic uh, expression of uh, engagement and uh, policy and program outcome. Um, community leadership is, is a manifestation of the citizen involvement and citizen involvement is 
um, is really what government should be all about. Government is a essentially a manifestation of citizens. So um, it's no secret that the reason why community benefits agreements and, and the CBA approach have taken off in Canada and internationally is because at the grassroots level, more and more communities feel that this is the best way to reap community benefits from infrastructure and building projects. Fantastic, thank you. And Ryan, why do you think that it's important to have community leadership in policy design? Well, for so many reasons, I think, you know, the best policy are the ones that come through a development process from the grassroots level. And we often talk about that as co-creation or, or co-production, which is, I think what Martin is referring to is this sort of notion of a participatory democracy where, where the people who are most impacted by an issue are involved in the policy making process. Uh, I've said for many years, and this is the reason I got into politics, was doing collective impact and social innovation work in communities, is that policy can either enable progress or it can inhibit progress. And I think good policy really enables it. And we often talk about social innovation ecosystems as requiring an enabling policy environment. Well, how do we get that? The only way we get it is if we participate in that process. So, and I think uh, who, who best really knows how to create value and, and solutions. And I think the best solutions I've ever seen are the ones that come from communities, from the grassroots, from the people who are most impacted. Absolutely. Did you have any questions for Martin? Yeah, I was, uh, I was really wondering uh, how the coalition came together and, and perhaps if you could elaborate a little bit on how you define success, Martin. Okay, well, um, first, first of all, I want to give a very quick shout out to Buy Social Canada and the Toronto Community Benefits Network, because uh, those two organizations really uh, lead the country in terms of uh, the fostering of community benefits agreements. And uh, we've learned a lot from them. They're, they're really our heroes, so thank you. Uh, we came together, Le Breton Flats site um, was once a major trading area for the Anishinaabe community. And it was also once a thriving working class community. And then in the 1960s, the federal government expropriated the land and pretty much uh, sat empty for many, many years. And uh, we came together when uh, the National Capital Commission announced a new process to develop develop a new master concept plan. And we felt that that would be an amazing opportunity for us to introduce the idea of a community benefits agreement approach. The definition of success, um, it's an organic process uh, of definition because we are by nature organic uh, organization. But um, I can tell you that first and foremost, uh, the institutionalization of community benefits agreement requirements by all three levels of government and the institutionalization of social procurement, which has been a big topic of today's event, um, are really at the top of the list. Without it being institutionalized, um, you're always going back to square one. It's like a Groundhog Day kind of dynamic. And it's also uh, a very inefficient uh, way to uh, bring things forward. Uh, we also would like to see pilot projects uh, to really, uh, so that all the stakeholders can get their fingernails dirty to see what works and what doesn't work. And um, we also believe in, uh, we support and we work with the city of Ottawa as they are working towards their social procurement policy and programs. And uh, we also think that uh, with the billions of dollars of uh, infrastructure and building projects in the queue for Ottawa, that that presents a great opportunity to uh, actually build community benefits agreements. Great. Um, well, we're just wrapping up. Maybe given your experience, Martin, um, in community advocacy, if you had one piece of advice as we look to social procurement tomorrow and what is possible, what advice would you give based on your lengthy experience? Well, my advice to uh, 
the uh, institutions and consultants and, and experts who are trying to make this happen is to make sure that you uh, build in enough time and space to bring in the communities at the grassroots level and give them the means by which they can organize themselves and, be, and, and develop social agency in the, in the process. Um, and for the policy makers, I would also ask that uh, you find time and space for organizations to bring forward uh, policy solutions that we think will work. There are many in Canada and internationally that are outside the box. So uh, let's keep an open mind to what we can do. Amazing. Thank you, Martin. And Thank Ryan, do you, you have a piece of advice that you'd like to give about people to people pushing social procurement forward tomorrow and what's possible? Well, I, I agree with everything Martin said, and I would just uh, say that uh, I think we need an overarching framework at the federal government level. That's something I'm very passionately engaged in. And uh, but I think at every level, uh, public purchasing is such a huge, huge opportunity to leverage that buying power. But it really does take uh, it's it's an institutional change. Uh, there's a culture of procurement that I think has to change. And I think, I think there's lots and lots of work to be done on that. And I look forward to undertaking that work. And Martin, congratulations again. It's wonderful what you're doing, what you're accomplishing. And I look forward to learning more about it. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you both. And oh, we're cheersing our waters. Um, thank you for joining me on the stage, Brian and Martin. Um, and I'll invite you both to exit. And I'm going to invite Eduardo and Agnes to join me for the next award. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, Agnes and Eduardo. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the next presenter. Agnes Garba is the Chief Operating Officer for SAP Labs Canada. SAP is a lead sponsor for the symposium and a previous social procurement champion. So we're thrilled to have uh, SAP back presenting. Welcome, Agnes. Thank you, Tori. It's nice to be here. So in the social procurement purchaser category, the demand side of the marketplace, the, two, the 2021 champion is the city of Calgary's benefit-driven procurement policy. Across Canada, the social procurement movement has been led on the municipal level and Calgary has set the bar high for all purchasers. Calgary is using a comprehensive approach that includes a three-year pilot and implementation strategy, evolving metrics, a multi-stakeholder engagement, training, and intentional change management, culminating in a recommended policy. Here to accept the award is Eduardo Gomez, who is the Procurement Transformation Lead for the City of Calgary. Congratulations, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnes. Uh, I am sitting here receiving this award, and I'm, I'm very thankful for receiving this award. However, I am not here alone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, first and foremost uh, Sarah Aspinal, who started all this party, uh, who started all this work. Um, thank also the other city uh, of Calgary employees, uh, including supply management. Our team of uh, a, a lot of a lot of work from our team came into play. Uh, a lot of our executives have been pushing this very hard. Obviously, thank uh, by social without. Uh, uh, without Dave LePage's um, help, uh, Tories, Neem, and uh, I don't want to forget anybody. So I, if I do, please, please forgive me. Um, and last, uh, our business community, because it takes uh, it takes two to tango. Uh, they've been embracing this. They've been pushing for this. Uh, the citizens, uh, other associations and other partners come to mind, like Momentum, uh, for example. So, so I'm sitting here uh, tossing on receiving this award. I'm very grateful for it, but I'm not alone. Uh, so, so, so in the name of all the people I mentioned, uh, thank you so much. Well, congratulations, Eduardo. You alluded to this in your thank you, but maybe I'd like to get more um, pointed in how are you using your networks and stakeholders to create a broader systems change through social procurement? Oh, good question, uh, Tori. And when and they taught me recently that when you say good question, it means that you really don't have an answer. <laughs> so you're, 
I, I think it's I think it's very organic. I, I think you create you create word of mouth um, through your social media, through conversations you have with people, uh, and then you start seeing uh, the results um, of of that. Uh, I think that given the times in which we are isolated in quarantine, etc., it, it becomes a little bit more complicated. But there's still those avenues to to explore, uh, uh, like. I'll give you an example. I, I posted something on LinkedIn the other day about uh, wanting to talk about innovation. And um, next thing I knew, I have 17 emails from 17 people I didn't know existed in the world. Uh, so so it's it's very powerful. Um, it, it also gets a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but yeah, I think it's very organic. Too. And you have the internal task force, though, when you talked about the different partners and stakeholders. How has that engaging with them helped shape the benefit-driven procurement as it is now? Oh, it's been crucial. It's been crucial. They they help us see things that we don't necessarily see in our limited view. Uh, so so our, our, our executive task force has many views. So we gather a, a 360 degree view. Uh, and I think it's been crucial. So going back to the, to that particular instance of, of the task force, uh, it's been crucial for our success. Great. And Agnes, maybe I'll pose that question to you because I think SAP is doing such great work in this area. How are you using your networks and stakeholders to create a broader systems change through social procurement? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So being a very large company, uh, you know, we, we really have a unique uh, responsibility and an opportunity to build this community. And you know, just give you an example, we have uh, about 77% of the world's transaction revenue touches an SAP system. So it's a, it's, it's a huge system. And with that, you know, we've been working now over a decade actually in trying to inspire and accelerate and scale social enterprises because we do believe that those are truly the organizations that can help change the narrative and solve social issues and, and trigger the systemic change that uh, uh, we'd like to see through innovation. And one example I can give you, I mean, certainly partnering with Buy Social Canada for us had been, you know, a huge, uh, uh, a huge, uh, uh, great partnership that helped a lot. And on a global level, also, I'd like to mention uh, an initiative that we launched last year, and it's called Five and Five by Twenty Five. So what this initiative is about is that we um, made a pledge that we are going to dedicate five percent of our addressable spend on diverse enterprises and 5% on social enterprises by 2025, which is, you know, that, that is a really big commitment, but we don't just want to leave this uh, pledge um, for us, for SAP, but really would like to encourage other organizations to sign up and also to make the pledge uh, for, towards this aspiring goal. And, um, you know, when somebody joins this initiative, uh, you know, we, we ask you that you formalize uh, the uh, exploration of the social procurement agreements. How do we partner with the right uh, community organizations and the right partners? Because it is not something that organizations can do on their own. Uh, and again, it's it's a great initiative that uh, I would highly recommend to others as well to consider, or even if it's not it, but some other ways to further social procurement, uh, because we do make purchasing decisions so much uh, all the time that it's it's a very important uh, aspect to consider going forward. That's an amazing initiative. So impressive to see a company like SAP who has so much strength and like capacity, 70% of business transactions in the world, leveraging that, that clout in the marketplace, your purchasing power to then start these conversations about social impact. So Agnes, what is possible? What is the vision for the future? If five and five by 25 is achieved, what does that look like? What do you see potentially for social procurement tomorrow? Well, I do believe that it's, it contributes to a much brighter future whereby we are looking at sustainability. So it will be much better from the, 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 the climate change and, and everything around sustainability from that perspective. It creates, the, it creates uh, stronger communities wherever we invest into these, into these, uh, into social enterprises. And uh, I do also believe that by doing so, it just gives a lot more purpose and meaning to many businesses that these days are, are really trying to find uh, purpose and meaning in their work and how we can contribute to something much bigger. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you're putting your purpose into practice, we say, with social procurement. Absolutely. Eduardo, do you have any thoughts on how social procurement could shape the future and what a possible vision could look like? Yes, I, I 
uh, not to quote anybody, but my dream is that uh, we level mm -hmm. the playing field at a point that social procurement is not needed anymore. That it's that it's it's all the same. It's a level playing field. Uh, everybody has the same resources, the same level of uh, uh, let's call it complexity for solving the problems. That so that buying social becomes just like buying regularly. It it becomes it becomes it's no longer a thing. It we do it as as we drive our cars. We do it. We don't even think about it. Uh, so that's my dream that we don't we, that we do it, but we don't even have to think about it. All procurement is social procurement. Mm -hmm. I love it. The beautiful vision. Amazing. Well, cheers to you and the City of Calgary Benefit Driven Questionnaire. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great day and continue your great work. Thank you. I live now, right? We'll see you. Well, we don't see you later, unfortunately. Yeah. Hopefully, I'll see you in the future in our business dealings, but uh, we won't see you the rest of the day. So, thank you so much, Agnes and Eduardo. Thank you. I'll bring you the in person event. We can all have flowers. Right. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you. And now, now I'd like to welcome um, Alicia, Chelsea, Sean, Mark, Marsha, all to the stage. I feel like I forgot. Yes, five people. You all made it. <laughs> Team high five. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And presenting the uh, final award for the day, I'd like to invite Alicia Masong Song to speak. Alicia Masong Song is the social plan planner in community economic development uh, for the city of Vancouver, who was last year's social procurement champion award winner for their community benefit agreement policy, which Alicia is very involved in. So very appropriate person to presenting this award today. Welcome, Alicia. Thanks, Tori. It's great to be here and great to be in such good company with everyone. Um, so on the supply side of the marketplace, uh, the social procurement champions are a group of social enterprises engaged in and supporting the construction industry across the country. They include Embers in Vancouver, Build in Winnipeg, Building Up in Toronto, and Impact Construction in St. John's. Congratulations to all of you. With the growing trend, yes, applause. <laughs> uh, with the growing trend of community benefit agreements and Infrastructure Canada's community employment benefits across the country, the construction supply chain for labor and subcontractors offers tremendous opportunities and social enterprises are definitely responding. These social enterprises are countering the preconceptions and myths that using social enterprise suppliers results in higher costs and lower quality. In fact, with their competitive pricing and quality work, these social enterprises working in the construction industry are creating pathways to skilled, meaningful, and well-paying work for youth and equi equity-seeking folks, while also filling critical labor gaps in the construction industry. These social enterprises represent what it means to build back better. So again, congrats to all of you. And now we'll move into um, some questions. So uh, feel free to, um, I'll, I'll kind of moderate this uh, for all of you to answer, but all of these questions are for each of you. Um, so whoever kind of puts their hand up first can, can, can answer the question. So the first question we have here is, what is the impact you're creating as a social enterprise in the construction industry? Okay. Marcia, go ahead. I, I'm always the one that sits at the front of the class and answers. So <laughs> I'm not even going to talk before I've even thought. Um, yeah. So the impact on the construction industry. Um, it's an interesting question. So, um, and we have a huge impact in the community, but there is also an impact in the construction industry. So we're a temporary staffing organization, just so people know. We, do, you know, so we're not an employee, you know, like we're not an employment agency, like a government employment agency, and we're not like a, we don't, we're not a, a con building contractor. But what we do is we supply staffing, we supply laborers to construction sites um, that companies pay for. So that, that's our business model. So. Um, sometimes they're called day labor companies and it's been a very exploitive sector actually it's a pretty bad sector and i think what we've done for the industry is raise the bar because uh you know 
all of our profits we run as a business like a temp labor company and we help people but all of our profits go back to invest in our workers so you know through extra training through providing wraparound supports through you know medical and dental benefits and probably the most important one to the worker themselves is higher wages and so in the end um we're kind of changing the industry itself so that's what i and i think in construction it's it's, it's having a big impact my two words. Wonderful. That's great. Sean, I know that you were close to answer this question next, so had, go ahead. I had my dukes up. <laughs> so like in Winnipeg, uh, where I live, um, things, you know, the thing about the trades is for the most part, people remember where they came from. I don't know if that's the same where everybody, people in, uh, in Marshallstown and Marktown, they're fancy people there. So I don't know, but here in Winnipeg, people remember where they came from. And so lots of times people are, uh, I find that, you know, business owners who are looking to expand their, uh, their staffing, they oftentimes will want to, um, to find a way to, to give the opportunity that they were given when they, when they first started out. Um, now they usually don't have a pipeline into that. So they end up, you know, hiring the next guy with the red seal or whatever, but, um, you know, over the years, Build has developed a network so that we can develop the next generation of labor force for folks, and uh, and then we can get you know uh, these these business owners so they can actually understand the impact that they're making, and then they can make the impact that they want. Like you know, we're talking like the difference between what we do at Build and the difference between like what they do at I don't know X contractor for profit contractor. It's a lot of it has to do with the amount of patience that we're able to give. Uh, and and the and the context that we have, they you know, lots of those guys, they're all, they're all, um, they want to do just exactly the same thing that we do. They just can't right now. So we 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 filled up this 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 perfect little niche that nobody knew was there, but it like it's like a natural uh, natural part of the uh, industry and sector. I think I can jump in now. Um, you know, when we think about our employment from our, uh, choices for youth in St. John's Newfoundland's context, you know, we come at this from a very different angle. You know, we're an agency that was founded on housing and ending youth homelessness in our community. But what we recognize what is ending youth homelessness in our community isn't just about you know, rapid rehousing or our shelter or connecting with community supports. It's about preventing homelessness because homelessness is a symptom of systematic breakdown, but also creating opportunities for young people um, who perhaps face system-based barriers or intergenerational poverty or trauma or any of these things. And using social enterprise as a way to create different kinds of opportunities for young people um, equitably. So we use our social enterprise impact instruction and a couple other of our social enterprises so young people can try on a job so they can make mistakes so they can uh, learn and grow and change. And it's funny because it seems like it's such a it's such a thing that like we all get to do. We we often, you know, we can rem all remember our 20s or late teens. And we were get a lot of us had the opportunity to try. A lot of the young people that we work with, perhaps those barriers have prevented them from being able to try on a job, to mess it up. And, and it really results uh, of, in our community, at least, um, in you know housing breakdown, family breakdown, relationships breakdown. So when we think about social enterprise and the impact for us, there's often like a prevention lens or a maintenance lens around maintaining your housing, creating stability, and and moving forward. And and like for the young people we have, we often say like, listen, this is the impact we have is helping you self determine, helping you build the confidence to create your own path. Um, we are just the mechanism. We're just the the uh, the in time supports uh, to whatever they want to build. Wonderful. Thanks, yeah. Chelsea, for that answer. And Mark. Yeah, I, I think it, it's really similar to the rest of uh, the folk, the award winners that I'm up here with. Um, I think uh, what Sean really said resonated when it's like we're doing what the industry wants to do but might not be in a position to do or feel that they're in a position to do um 
and I think, you know, here in Toronto, there's a massive need for more skilled labor um, and massive amounts of people that are looking for access to those jobs. So it's sort of a strange disconnect to exist. And I think like the role that we can play in the sector in which we have been playing is just helping to connect those dots and connecting the people that are really looking for that work to, to the employers that are really looking to hire people for that work. Um, and, um, you know, that's sort of been what we've been pushing from the beginning and, um, it, it seems to people have been responding to it and, and there's really a need and there's a, not only a need for building up, but for all the other programs that exist um in the city and i'm sure in other cities to to really connect this labor sh labor shortage to the community that's looking for the work wonderful thanks everyone for those great answers um so this next question is is kind of exploring deeper into why do all of you believe there is potential in construction to create this community impact so what are some of the levers in the construction industry that you of your organization being able to create that impact? I mean, have you seen the budgets that are coming out of governments and how much they're spending on infrastructure? And like Winnipeg has like a $2 billion water treatment plant coming up. That's a lot of money. That's a, that's a lot. And that's also a lot of children coming out of government care and a lot of people who are needlessly over incarcerated over and over again, not because they aren't doing bad things, which they are, but they just aren't disengaged with the, you know, above ground economy. So we have this huge pot of money. Like, I don't know about you guys, but nobody's like kicking down our door to give us funding for stuff. <laughs> so the money's going somewhere. So we might as well go for the biggest pot. And, uh, and like, I don't know, like we're, we're different from Marsha. Marsha's, the Embers team, they're, they labor, so they can access a lot of stuff. We're general contractors, but you know what? Who cares if we're general contractors? If someone wants to drop a million dollars down and build us a, a bridge or something, but they want to get, um, they want to get, you know, put some heart into it and, and, uh, and hire some folks who, who could use a break and put their families back together, then guess what we do? We do that. We do exactly that thing because uh, because I, I, the truth is, who cares about construction, right? I mean, you know, some people are really passionate about building things and measuring things and cutting things and blah blah blah. But who who really cares about that? What I care about is what we're actually making, which is this next generation of workforce and healthy families and a healthy community. Winnipeg is, you know, Treaty One. We have like the second poorest postal code in Canada. We got a lot of poverty and people are really, really desperate. We've got a neighborhood that's been in like a depression for 50 years. And uh, and we've got to choke the dragon somehow. So that's that's what I say. Like that is why I think there's opportunity in construction, just for the, the bloody fact that people are spending money here. Yeah, I'm gonna mute myself because I got all blah. There. <laughs> Thanks, Mark, for your enthusiastic response. Um, so Mark up now so go ahead yeah well i just i guess i want to speak and of course i you know everything you said sean is right i mean the opportunities are, are enormous here and there's a huge labor shortage big demand but construction is a particular kind of sector that is um it's a very forgiving and inclusive se sector and that's why we started it because you can come in there with almost with no no skills whatsoever you can start and you can learn skills and there's a tremendous career path for people like you can you can become an apprentice you can learn a trade or you can become a hoist operator so people come to us as general laborers and we with our money we we provide training and when we see somebody who is keen and 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 we work with the companies and we can train them up within 6 months uh, they can go from a a uh, 16 hour and a dollar job to uh, $25 an hour. They might be a hoist operator or a construction safety officer. We do that all the time. So there's a tremendous career path there. And um, I think they're more and more open to the, to women. And, you know, it's, it's just, I think it's, a, it, it, it's really good. It's easy to enter and it's a great career path and there's huge demand. So that's what I'm, I think. Uh, I jump in i think like 
I echo everything everybody said, but I, I want to bring in like balance of power in communities. I think there's something there, you know, is communities who kind of since lost control over the places in which they live and things have, you know, infiltrated neighborhoods and communities in ways that like haven't benefited communities. So why wouldn't we leverage um, what it means to build infrastructure, build social infrastructure that communities use? Why wouldn't communities be a greater, have greater participation in that? And I, I often talk about our work with, from equity lens, but this one I think requires a bit more forceful language. It's about the balance of power in communities and communities taking and being part of the, the fabric and framework, but also the building. So that when it push comes to shove, we've, we've had some really strong participation to those who need it. And that's what I think construction can do. Great, thanks Chelsea for that answer. And Mark? Over to you. I mean, I I, I echo uh, a, lo a lot of what Marcia said as well, with just seeing the quick the the barriers to entry are relatively low relative to the amount of pay that people can receive in this industry, um, and I think it's just. Uh, it's just there, you know, it's just there for the taking. And there's so much money being spent as Sean and, and Chelsea have pointed out as well. And as social enterprises, we're, we're just saying, hey, don't don't spend more money, just spend that money more intentionally and get a little more out of it. And um, I think I think it's the sector that lends itself to social enterprise better than better than anything based on the quality of work the need for people, the low barriers to enter the sector, and just the the overall just like shortage of contractors as well, let alone tradespeople. Like people need people like to, to, people have trouble finding people to pay to do work. So it's like um, we can get involved in that. Great. I might chime in, Alicia. Um, and I'm just curious, one question that I had um, given the lengthy experience um, with each of you in construction with social enterprise, can you give us one on the ground success story to put this kind of conversation into context about what impact is possible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure everybody, I'll try, I'll, I'll do it fast. I will can talk about Anil, for example, who came to us and he had mental health problems, depression, anxiety. He could only work a couple of days a week and sometimes he could work and then he would just go and hide under the covers and would have. And he did this off and on for a while, but he came to understand that work was his therapy. That's what he kept telling us. He told his therapist, work is my therapy because he realized he was starting to feel better when he was working. And gradually he built that up. And for him, it was probably a couple of years to Today, he's um, he's the uh, construction safety officer on a very very large construction site. We had trained him up as a hoist operator and construction safety officer. But now the company he's working with the company, and they want to send him back to school to become a, a project manager. Now this is a guy that you know, and he's working and he's calling us for for laborers now, um, and that's what you can do in construction. It's an it's it's an amazing uh, field. Yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. I've got a quick story. Um, we were building a uh, some housing, uh, five units of affordable housing for pregnant and parenting young moms in our community. And um, we had a young woman who was, you know, had tried her hand at a couple of the social enterprises training. And nothing was really sticking. Nothing was really working for her. And uh, we had this housing build and she had never seen herself in construction but because we were building this building that had such great intention and she knew a few of the young parents who were moving in she said i'm interested in working in this project because it, it makes sense in my world anyway she sure enough we got connected with our, our one of our contractors who was doing the electrical work and just really just uncovered a passion for what it means to work in um, in that field as an electrician. So she laid, you know, she laid cables with this one particular um, 
journeyman and she just really fell in love with it anyway fast forward now she just graduated top of her class and that subcontractor actually hired her on for her apprenticeship so and that's a pretty cool story and at the end of the day you know it is all about purpose isn't it like we connect with things we're all we and as marcia said you know when you connect in when you find that sense of confidence and purpose you know there is a career path for everyone and it's a it's a very exciting thing to see playing out amazing yeah i think when we talk about healthy vibrant communities i think of like and every individual has the opportunity to find that sense of purpose in their work so thanks chelsea sean you're unmuted do you have in, a uh, yeah so in manitoba you can't buy a car without an immobilizer in it uh, and the reason is is uh you know about 20 years ago we had a real big problem with auto theft everybody was stealing cars uh, and it was actually like a very small amount of people that were stealing a huge amount of cars this one family in particular so anyways years ago we hired uh one of the uh one of the people from that family she sold a lot of cars she actually came in handy with people who locked their keys in the trucks she knew how to get into everything um she had um uh, she was a, a mother of five. She had five lifetime bans on a driver's license. All five children were, were in the care of the problems. And um, so she worked for us. She couldn't drive. Um, she knew how to drive. She couldn't get a license, of course, because because uh, of all those lifetime bans. She became one of our best mentors on the job site. She got clean. Um, and uh, and so we, we, we saw that her goals were to become a mom again and so our our case management team we got on the horn and we called and we called and we called every advocate we could find um and within a few months all five children came home to live with their mom and um we encouraged her and we wrote her letters of reference and she went before the appeals board and on her 30th birthday she got her driver's license mm -hmm. and she now can have the things that I have. She can have access to the stuff that I can get. And it wasn't because there was a million people out there trying to help her out, but it was it was that uh, we had the ability as a social enterprise to just stop for a second, take a breath, and realize that the goal for her wasn't blowing extra attics of insulation, but it was actually, you know, she was at work to become a mom. And to be able to take care of her kids so she is now i mean she has a really hard job now because now she's a single mother of five but <laughs> but she those kids are at home so i won't tell you any names because she's not here and she's not whatever but yeah, that's wow. one story that is one story only one yeah. of the thousands of millions millions of stories amazing that's so incredible to hear mark i don't know if you're gonna be able to follow that one up yeah, I mean, <laughs> like for me, it, it's it's similar stories are the ones that stick out or when people get their kids back after not being or, you know, ha having them taken away and um, having like the opportunity to go to like a bunch of weddings of people that have gone through the building up program and, you know, like see their families and talk to their families and be like, oh, you know, everyone's saying this wouldn't have been happened if like they didn't have that sort of moment, you know, that those are big moments that stand out. And again, like it's, there's just like, there's each person that, you know, every two months there's a cohort of 12 people, you know, and that's a uh, 12 different story and, and not, it doesn't work out every time, but I mean, there's a pretty good chance that there's going to be something positive that comes up comes out of the experience so it's been really cool just to like take something that's like in theory oh there'll be social procurement there'll be community benefits these are all things that should happen and they're gonna all happen in the back of your mind they seem like these big things but it's like the the real big things are just like these independent experiences that come from it at least for me i couldn't agree more i think we've had so many big conversations today about the high level but hearing each of these stories from you um, about what that actually means on the ground and what we really are trying to accomplish here with social procurement is tilting the playing field and getting it so that, you know, there is opportunities for equity and inclusion for all people in our communities. Amazing.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Alicia, so much for hosting. Um, congratulations of all of you on your award. We'll be sending you a mug. I invite you all to join me in a water cheers. <laughs> Congrats. So that concludes our social procurement champion awards for the day. I invite you all to leave the screen and I will say our closing remarks. Amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much, all of you who have stuck with us throughout the day and who have come in for part of it. It's been absolutely incredible to have you here for these conversations. Um, the speakers and panelists, really, this has been so immeasurably valuable. It couldn't be just the Biosocial Canada team here today. We're just part of the journey and happy to be working with you and supporting you um, and hear your amazing stories and the work that you're doing in social procurement. Thank you so much to the lead sponsors, SAP, Shandos, S4ES. Without you, we wouldn't be here today and your continued support is so valuable to us. I'd like to thank our event host, the Social Enterprise World Forum. As we've touched on, they're hosting a policy forum for the next two days and tickets are free. So I encourage everyone to come join and there will be some conversations around social procurement there as well. And now all of you that are still here, I encourage you to challenge yourselves to consider what step you can take um, to incorporate what you've learned, who you've connected with um, into furthering social procurement in your community. If you need any help or have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to the Biosocial Canada team. We're here to support and grow social procurement. That is our mission. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll have some training opportunities for suppliers. We'll have procurement and storytelling training throughout the year. We'll be having our social procurement professional certificate for those of you interested in purchasing with impact and learning more. We'll be doing a community wealth building social procurement webinar series based in Ontario and details will be coming soon. So to stay up to date in all of this, um, please make sure this letter um, is that's where we'll be sending out all the updates in a timely manner. And without further ado, I'd like to wrap up today. So thank you all so much. Thank you to the Biosocial Canada team for all your support and um, making this day possible. David, Maham, Liz, and Neve was in the background all day making sure everything ran smoothly. So thank you all so much. Have a great day, everybody.